Greetings and thanks for tuning in. This week, our COVID case rates fell below 100 per 100,000 for the first time since December 15th. We're now in substantial transmission as defined by the CDC after having been in high transmission for nearly two months. Our test positivity rate also continues to drop. We've seen an eight-fold decrease since the peak of the surge just over a month ago. And there are currently 122 hospitalized COVID patients, which is nearly an 80% reduction since our peak. All good news. Next week, Montgomery County's indoor mask mandate will end on Monday, February 21st. And the County Council President said on Monday that our proof of vaccination legislation was not going to be voted on at this time. As I stated since last summer, I believe proof of vaccination would be an important tool, especially during surges like this one that we've been coming out of. That is why in December I asked the Council to implement it as Omicron was surging. I do hope that if or when another surge happens, we're willing to consider these kinds of measures to protect the health of our residents. The best tool we have to protect our communities is vaccinations and boosters. We are still awaiting an emergency use authorization for the Pfizer vaccine in children six months to five years. This week, the FDA has postponed the review of data on efficacy from vaccine trials to accommodate the collection of additional data. Pfizer is also conducting an ongoing trial of a third vaccine dose for these younger children and expects to have data on three doses available in early April. Montgomery County has 50,000 children in this age range. And let's hope for these children and their families, this last remaining unvaccinated cohort, can become eligible as soon as possible. We're also continuing to focus our community engagement efforts to promote boosters. We're hosting our second Boosterama at Westfield Wheaton this Saturday from 1 to 4 p.m. We'll be located outside Dick's Sporting Goods store, and we'll also be handing out rapid tests, face masks, and raffling some mall gift cards for those who get boosted. Getting boosted is a key to being as protected as you can be from COVID. Our booster rates are still hovering around 50% of our eligible population, and it's below 50% for our communities of color and younger adults. We had great success with our last boost, Rob, and I'm hoping that this one will go well. I want to thank Westfield Wheaton and our partners at Salute Vienna Star for their continued efforts and support implementing equity in everything we do. In 1966, Martin Luther King said at the Human Rights Forum, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. As we focus our continued response to recovery from COVID, we cannot ignore the inequities due to our nation's long and tragic history of systemic racism. It was serendipitous that just before the pandemic began two years ago this month, Tiffany Ward was confirmed as our county's first chief equity officer. Over the last two years, Tiffany has done an incredible job establishing our Office of Racial Equity and Social Justice ensuring that this government will be making policy and budget decisions moving forward through an equity lens. One such area of that focus has gotten a lot of debate in the community, and that's the general plan for the county known as Thrive 2050. For more than a year, I've been raising concerns about the process, content, and transparency surrounding Thrive. And recently, the Council's Office of Legislative Oversight, known as OLO, has raised concern about Thrive's lack of focus and inattention to equity. This plan's lack of equity and lack of effort to concretely address the severe shortage of affordable housing that projections showed will be amplified by both a projected loss of affordable housing units over the next decade, complicated by an increase in new residents whose income will require even more affordable units. Thrive does not address these major issues. LOL recognized the lack of deep community engagement with communities of color and low-income people. Any plan without the input of the communities of color cannot be equitable. Thrive fails to acknowledge the link between housing ownership and the current wealth, racial wealth gap. Wealth accumulated through home equity is often used to further education and business opportunities for white residents at the exclusion of people of color who don't have the opportunity to own houses. Home ownership and home values have huge implications for economic and workforce success, and the Thrive Plan fails to make any connection to this at all. We agree with the Office of Legislative Oversight's assessment that the Thrive Plan should be specific about the current inequities. The plan should pinpoint disaggregated data on, and outline the disparities they intend to close with the new plan. 
I'm going to give you one quick example. In Montgomery County today, there are about 24,000 households whose incomes are around $30,000 who are not in supported housing. They're living in market housing that is far above their income range, and most of them are spending 50 to 60% of their income on housing. In addition to that group, there's another 23,000 people who have incomes between $30,000 and $50,000 who are also paying 50 to 60% of their income on housing because without units available in their price range, both of these groups are forced to live in more expensive housing in the county. And of course, with them taking up spaces in the more expensive housing, it means it's harder for people with the incomes that could afford that housing otherwise to find units. We have a big problem, but if we don't deal with this, we are not going to fix it. On another topic, last weekend, I was proud to join Council President uh, Gabe Albernoz, Representative Jamie Raskin, along with other elected officials and community advocates in Wheaton for a Vision Zero Walk that was organized by Council Vice President Devin Glass. The somber event refocused our attention on our efforts to reduce and eliminate pedestrian and cyclist deaths on our roadways. We've only been a few weeks into this new year, and we already have had three fatalities, two pedestrians and one cyclist. Last year, we had a total of seven pedestrian fatalities, and that was down from 16 in 2020. However, one fatality is one too many, and we're implementing as many strategies as possible to protect and prevent future fatalities. My recent recommendation to the council and the capital budget includes $433 million over the next six years to support the county's Vision Zero efforts. Getting to zero fatalities is not going to be easy, and we will continue to address this issue at the federal, state, and county levels. For the first time since the pandemic began in 2020, I've returned to Annapolis to testify in person on behalf of four important bills before the General Assembly. In my testimony, I express strong support for the Climate Solutions Now Bill, which is critical to the implementation of our climate action plan and our goal to reduce greenhouse gases by 100% by 2035. I also testified in support of a bill to expand our maker economy. And I was pleased to testify on two bills sponsored by Senator Susan Lee, one that addresses American history content and the Senate version of the bill to ban dangerous ghost guns. I've been looking into this subject, particularly to see what's available online. And I have to say, it is stunning that you can buy a kit to assemble a gun and put that gun together in very short order and do that without any registration of the weapon, without meeting any of the gun laws because of a loophole that says you can make your own gun. So basically people who otherwise would be prohibited from buying a gun are able to make guns by ordering the parts online and having them shipped to them. And there are plenty of videos to tell you how to put the kits together. There are circumventing laws that were meant to keep guns out of the hands of dangerous people. This is a problem. Additionally, I attended a press conference at the New Carrollton Metro and Mark Station in support of Maryland Regional uh, Transformation Act and the Equitable and Inclusive Transit-Oriented Development Enhancement Act. I want to thank Delegate Jared Solomon for his work on these important bills, which are critical to our economic development progress, as well as our efforts to combat climate change. As the Maryland General Assembly begins its second of three months of legislative deliberations, I appreciate the hard work of our State House and Senate delegations. I look forward to continue supporting their efforts to pass meaningful reforms, oversight, and investments in Montgomery County and throughout the state. This Friday, February 18th, we'll host our annual Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. commemorative event. The event was originally planned for January, but was postponed due to the Omicron surge. This year's theme is Ordinary People Doing Extraordinary Things for the fight for freedom. A tribute honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and heroes of the civil rights movement. The event this freedom will take place at 7.30 p.m. at the Music Center at Strathmore. This event will highlight local civil rights participants and make significant contributions to the fight for justice in Montgomery County and include musical performances and reenactments of celebrities such as Harry Belafonte, Joan Baez, Mahalia Jackson, Nina Simone, and more. Please join us for this free event by going to the homepage of our website, MontgomeryCountyMD.gov, and click on the link to RSVP. I hope to see you there.
Thank you for joining me, and I hope you have a good week.